So uh, it's great to, to be here. So um, anyway, I'm going to be talking about some work uh, looking at recent uh, human history and uh, natural selection from genetic variation data. And just by virtue of introduction, if we take the genomes or the sequence of uh, DNA from a variety of individuals and line them up together, we might see a pattern that would look something like this. There'll be some columns in the alignment uh, or some sites in the, uh, in the genome where some individuals carry one particular base or nucleotide. In this case, uh, Moto Kimura carries the, uh, the C nucleotide, while other individuals carry a different one uh, or the, the T nucleotide. And if you look across the genome, what you'll, what you'll find are is that on average there'll be in between any two genomes about one of these um, uh, base changes every uh, thousand or so uh, bases along the sequence. So these particular sites are called single nucleotide polymorphisms and they will be the focus of, um, of my talk. And the reason that I'm interested in uh, genetic variation and SNPs in particular is that these are the, um, they're the byproduct of, of hundreds of thousands of years of evolutionary history. In other words, the patterns of genetic variation that we see in the population today got there uh, over long periods of time. So for example, this would be one um, possible uh, relationship between all of these individuals that were um, sampled from the population here. Of course, we don't actually know what this underlying genealogy or relationship is. Rather, um, all we get to see are the patterns of genetic variation um, in the population today, and we can try to use that to reconstruct what happened in the past. And I should point out, uh, if you have any questions or if anything's not clear during the talk, please uh, feel free to jump in. You don't need to uh, wait till the end. Um, so the study of genetic variation data has undergone a transformation in the last five or so years, and a lot of that stems from uh, what's called next generation sequencing technology. So this is uh, laboratory uh, improvements in laboratory techniques that um, have increased the throughput of sequencing quite dramatically. And this plot over here shows the essentially cost to get a, a megabase or a million base pairs of DNA sequenced and how that cost has changed over time. And what you can see when next generation sequencing was introduced, the cost uh, of sequencing a megabase of DNA has plummeted. And as a result of that, the amount of sequencing data that's been generated has also dramatically increased over time. So we're entering a field in population genetics or entering a time when the field is no longer data limited and there's uh, plenty of data uh, to be analyzed. And I guess one other uh, additional evidence of that comes from large scale uh, uh, projects such as the Thousand Genomes Project in humans. Uh, where what they wanted to do was a sequence uh, many humans, so over, just over 1,000 um, to low coverage. And this uh, table here is just showing that they, for example, uh, generated 19,000 gigabases uh, of DNA sequence. So that's a, a ton of data. They found over um, 36 million of these SNPs or variable sites across all of those, uh, uh, all of those genomes. And this enterprise of generating genetic variation data from large numbers of individuals is going to um, increase over the coming years. So what, what we like to do is to be able to use this kind of genetic variation data to answer questions in evolutionary genetics. Now, while that may seem like a um, straightforward enterprise, often the types of signals that we're looking for are quite subtle. And so we need um, population genetic models and statistical approaches to be able to detect subtle signals in this genetic variation data to then make accurate inferences uh, in evolutionary genetics. So there's sort of, uh, I'd say, two, two major goals in, uh, or areas of, um, of uh, research in, in human genetics, or excuse, excuse me, in human evolutionary genetics. Uh, the first of with, which is understanding human history from genetic variation data. And current genetic evidence, as well as fossil evidence and other anthropological studies, suggests that anatomically modern humans originated within Africa somewhere between 100,000 and 200,000 years ago, that there were early expansions within Africa, say within the last 100,000 years or so, and then more recently, maybe 40 to 80,000 years ago, there was a migration of humans outside of Africa to then go on and populate the rest of the world. While most geneticists agree with the um, this sort of summary of hu human evolution that I've um, presented here, uh, 
In fact, the picture is obviously much more complex than what I've outlined here. And current research is focused on filling in a lot of the details uh, in, in this uh, scenario that I just outlined. So first, there's tremendous interest in looking at you know, what role uh, or how modern humans may have interacted with archaic uh, populations like Neanderthals and Denisovans. And current evidence suggests that there, in fact, was um, mating between those uh, uh, different groups. Um, and additional uh, current work focuses on trying to essentially fill in some of these details, so make some of these dates more precise. And you notice the story here sort of stopped about 40,000 years ago. Obviously, a lot has happened since then. So we're interested in filling in a lot of, uh, you know, using genetic variation data to try to learn about more recent events. The second sort of big category of questions in uh, human evolutionary genetics is focused on understanding natural selection and how that might have uh, affected the, uh, the human genome. So natural selection is, uh, in, in this context, refers to the uh, notion that individuals who have one particular uh, uh, variant or one particular genotype will tend to have more offspring than individuals who have the other uh, uh, variant. And so there's two main types of natural selection um, that, um, that uh, we're interested in here. So the first is what's called positive natural selection, and this is what you often think about when, when you hear the term natural selection. That's referring to adaptations. Uh, and so these refer to, at the genetic level, if you have a mutation that confers some sort of fitness advantage. And so individuals who carry that particular allele will tend to have more offspring than in individuals who don't. Then that particular allele will increase in frequency until all of the individuals in the population carry it. A second type of natural selection is what's called negative or purifying natural selection. And this is essentially the opposite of um, positive selection. And here the idea is that deleterious mutations occur uh, in the genome, and deleterious mutations reduce fitness. And so individuals who will carry them will tend to um, reproduce at a slower rate than individuals who don't. And as such, these mutations will tend to um, um, be lost from the population. So currently, uh, we're interested in trying to distinguish the importance or the prevalence of these two types of natural selection at affecting patterns of variation uh, throughout the genome. So in my talk here today, I'm going to tell you about two different projects, but that each one is aimed at understanding these sort of broader uh, questions in evolutionary genetics that I just um, spoke about. So the first topic is related to learning about recent human history within the last uh, 5,000 years from genetic variation data from large samples of individuals. And in particular, um, I'm interested in comparing how patterns of growth vary across different populations. And the second part of my talk will be focused on looking at genetic diversity on the human Y chromosome and looking at what um, evolutionary explanations might account for uh, the diversity levels that are seen there. Can yes? I'm sorry? Why are you particularly interested in 5,000? Well, just recent. Within the last five or so, I mean, it's, that's not a hard number. So, five to 10,000 as opposed to 40 or 1,000 years ago or older. <clears throat> so, this is a uh, figure taken from a review article from Alon Kynan and Andy Clark that came out recently. And what this um, plot here is showing on a log scale is essentially how the human population size has changed over roughly the last 10,000 years. And what you can see from this plot is that there was, for you know, maybe up until about 2,000, um, or from 8,000 to, or excuse me, 10,000 years ago up to the last, say, 2,000 years, a fairly uh, linear increase on the log scale, so an exponential increase in um, population size. And then more recently, there's this uh, super exponential um, population growth. So that's what you s intuitively might imagine and what census data um, tend to support. But studies of genetic variation over the last um, you know, several decades generally haven't seen as much evidence for this recent population growth. And the reason for that is fairly um, uh, straightforward after, um, after you think about it, and that is that uh, studies of genetic variation typically have small sample sizes, uh, say of maybe 10 to 20 individuals. And when you have uh, a, such a small sample of individuals, most of the genetic variants that are included in that sample will tend to be more common in the population. And as such, they arose 
fairly anciently before this time period on the slide, and so you're not getting information about what happened within the last 10,000 years. But in large part due to the uh, sequencing technologies that I uh, mentioned briefly before, over the last few years there have been a, a plethora of um, studies uh, looking at genetic variation in large samples. So here we're talking over a thousand individuals. And what these studies are, tend to find is in fact there is evidence for recent um, population growth. And so I'll walk you through uh, what this figure shows. This is a figure taken from um, a paper by Tennyson et al. Um, and what this figure shows, this is a uh, result of, um, they looked at the genetic variation data and fit a demographic model to the data. I'll talk a bit more about how that approach works um, in, in subsequent slides. But the basic idea is they fit this kind of model to the data where, you know, uh, back in time up here, there was a out of Africa bottleneck, so separation between non-African and African populations. And then within, say, the last 5,000 years, they estimated that the populations expanded pretty, uh, pretty dramatically, both the African and the uh, uh, European population, uh, as shown here. So the other studies here essentially came to qualitatively similar conclusions that there's evidence for recent, uh, population, gene uh, recent population growth from genetic variation in these uh, large sample sizes. But one important point is that these previous studies did not consider uh, East Asian populations. They were focused predominantly on European populations and then with a little bit of a focus on um, African populations. And so if we just look at the amount of the, of the world's population and how that's essentially divided up over, uh, over these different regions, what you'll find, in fact, is that um, you know, a lot of the world's population is found within Asia and in particular in, in China. And so obviously this is, again, based on census data. So what we want to be able to do is uh, essentially look at what do patterns of genetic variation tell us about uh, recent population history from China. And so some more precise questions are, does genetic variation data within China support uh, a signal for recent population growth? Is this uh, inferred growth stronger than what we see in European populations? How compatible are the genetic and uh, census data? In other words, how compatible is the genetic data with essentially this uh, kind of picture here. And lastly, what effect does growth have on uh, patterns of deleterious mutations in uh, East Asian compared to other populations? And so we set out to uh, try to answer this question. And we did that using uh, exome, what's called exome sequencing data. So exome refers to the protein coding uh, regions of the genome. And so we had uh, this exome sequencing data from 2,000 uh, Danish individuals and 1,500 uh, Chinese exomes. And the Chinese individuals were from the Anhui uh, province in, uh, in China. And they were sequenced to fairly high coverage. This is about the 1%, 1 to 2 percent of the genome here that we uh, have and that we're analyzing uh, from these individuals. And importantly, uh, we processed the data from all of this using the same bioinformatic pipeline because systematic differences in how you process the data can lead to uh, what appear to be interesting um, signals but actually are artifacts due to how you handled the, uh, the data. And so what we wanted to do is then estimate from this kind of data, estimate uh, recent demographic history in these two populations. Uh, I should also point out that we, we're looking at the exome sequencing data. We're focusing on what are called the synonymous uh, sites. So these are those mutations in the DNA sequence that don't change the uh, encoded amino acids. The idea is they're less likely to be under natural selection than the um, uh, mutations that do result in an amino acid uh, change. So I'm not going to go through all this. This is just to show the uh, bioinformatic uh, pipeline for handling the data. But there are lots of uh, steps that uh, were used to, to, um, to do it. And I'm you know, happy to talk about it after if anyone is particularly interested in, in how, we, uh, how we did this. Um, OK, so what, do, what did the data actually look like? I'm going to spend a few minutes on this particular slide because this is, I think, quite informative about what we actually found in the data and then also how we estimated the, uh, the demographic parameters. So this is what's called the, uh, the site frequency spectrum, and it's a very rich statistic used in um, population genetics. And the basic idea is this is a histogram where what we're plotting is the proportion of SNPs in our data set that have a particular uh, minor allele frequency in the data. So what do I mean by that? This first bin here is the proportion of those um, SNPs in our data set where 
one of the two alleles is seen only once, and the other allele is seen in all the other individuals. And so what this is telling you is that, for example, in the Danish data in blue, that about 44% of all the SNPs, uh, the minor allele uh, had a frequency of one in the, uh, in the data set. So that's quite, quite a few of them. And then similarly, this is saying about 10% of the SNPs, the minor allele was seen twice, and so on and so forth. Now, I truncated this and put everything greater than 10 in there because otherwise this plot would go off the screen and you wouldn't be able to actually see anything. Because keep in mind, we had a uh, very big uh, sample size here of um, 1,500 individuals for, for both populations. So in blue is the frequency spectrum for the um, Danish population, in red for the uh, Han Chinese, and in black is the, uh, what you would predict from or what theory would say the frequency spectrum should look like in a population of constant size with no population structure or any other sorts of interesting things going on. So a couple immediate trends you know, jump out at you from this graph. And the first is that in the actual data, there are quite a few more singletons and doubletons than what you'd predict from the, uh, from the model. Um, and then conversely, there's a deficit of more common variants than what you would predict um, from the model. And, and the explanation for this is the recent population growth. Um, and the way recent, what recent population growth does is essentially you have uh, many more new mutations entering the population as the population expands, and those mutations are going to be rarer. And that's what essentially this excess of uh, singletons and doubletons uh, reflects. The second thing that you note is that both populations show an increase in low-frequency variants, but this increase is, uh, at least for the singletons, there's a higher proportion of them in the Han Chinese, about 60%, compared to the, the uh, Danish population where the, only about 45% of the variants are singletons. And so what this suggests is that there's some difference in population history uh, between these uh, uh, two populations that can account for this pattern. Furthermore, there's a higher proportion of more common variants in the Danish population than in the, uh, the East Asian population. And essentially that, this is essentially a byproduct of the pattern over here because it's a proportional shift. If one goes up, the other has to go down. But um, you can see the pattern nevertheless is quite, uh, quite striking. So what we want to be able to do, that's a qualitative look at the data. What we'd like to be able to do is to take that frequency spectrum and actually look at some models of population history to see what, uh, what uh, the data are, are telling us and what might be compatible with it. So what we wanted to do is take a demographic model that looks something like this, where this is the present day down here, where I'm showing the N3. Yes? Sorry, I think this is a really stupid question, but um, backing up to the, just the logic of how to interpret that. Yeah. Uh, I understand completely your statement, well, if the population has expanded frequently, uh, recently, very rapidly, then there'll be many rare mutations because if those occur during a single lifetime, for example, um, and there have only been a small number of lifetimes during which the population had expanded, then we'll get lots of those rare ones. It makes perfectly good sense. Um, what I'm struggling with is, is how to reconcile that with, um, and maybe it's just a close understanding, um, the, the notion that, well, if you had a small population that expanded relatively quickly, it would be more homogeneous than a population that had been growing slowly over time because there'd be a founder effect, basically. There wouldn't be very much variation there initially, um, and that's reflected in the homogeneity of the extant population. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's hard sort of in a qualitative sense without sort of specifying exactly the parameter values on, on them to say which would necessarily be more, more homogeneous. So in other words, you have, different, um, you have different effects going on. If you have a small population size to start with, then you're going to have very little genetic diversity up until recently. And then if the expansion is fairly recent, you might not pick up, as, had, as was the case for a lot of the earlier human studies, you won't pick up on it and you'll see everything will look, it'll look like a really homogeneous population. In other words, little genetic diversity. Whereas if you had a population that had been expanding sort of more slowly over a longer time, then even with the smaller sample size, you, might, you, you still might be picking up on a lot of diversity and so it'll appear to be more diverse. Um, if you had essentially data, I guess a thought exercise had data from the whole populations and looked, I think then 
I'd say then it might depend on the particular parameters in terms of how small it was, how big the final population is, and what the time interval uh, would be in terms of which you'd expect to be uh, more, more homogeneous. Yeah, but that, that's, that's not a, that's not a uh, dumb question. That's, uh, it's actually quite complex uh, trying to reconcile these different uh, patterns together. And, and that actually is why uh, you essentially need, or that's how uh, or what model-based uh, inference can help you with in terms of actually trying to layer some parameter estimates uh, on, on, top of the, uh, on top of the data. So we looked at a, a model that looked something like this where we had a, uh, that included a population bottleneck at some time in the, uh, in the past, followed by recovery, and then uh, more recent exponential growth. And so these numbers here like T2, T3, and the three population sizes, th those are what we wanted to estimate from the uh, genetic variation data. And we wanted to do that for the Danish data and then for the, uh, the Han Chinese. And so the basic idea of how this works in a uh, qualitative way, and then I'll, I'll give some of the more uh, precise uh, um, concepts in a minute. Whoops, I don't want to do that. Um, so basically, if we, this is the frequency spectrum from our, our actual data. In other words, what I showed on the, the previous slide. So we have that frequency spectrum. And what we want to do is consider many different models of population history here. So this is a bit simpler than on the last slide, but this is for illustrative purposes. The concept is the same. So these are, this would be the present day, and the size of this box here indicates the size of the population, and the height here indicates like when the growth occurred. So for example, this model has more ancient growth than this one here. So the idea is we have a bunch of these different models of population history, and these could be what we think uh, we'd look at obviously more than four, but again, for illustrative purposes, we have these four different models. And what we can do is use the tools of population genetics, either coalescent theory or uh, diffusion theory in, in this particular case, to ask what would these different models of population history predict the site frequency spectrum would look like. So if the growth occurred recently, we'd predict this frequency spectrum. If the growth occurred more anciently, the frequency spectrum would look like this, and so on and so forth. So we can generate the frequency spectra for many different models, and then compare our observed frequency spectrum to all of these different, or to the frequency spectra from all these different models, and essentially look at which one fits the best. And what you can see here for this cartoon example is that this particular model uh, shown here that has the uh, recent but extreme population growth tends to fit the, uh, the data better than do these other uh, models here. So that's the basic idea of what um, what we're going to do. And for the aficionados out there, what we, the way we actually did this was we used the program called uh, uh, Daddy from uh, Ryan Gutenkunst and Carlos Bustamante. And the basic idea behind this approach is it uses diffusion equations to essentially get the uh, frequency spectrum for a given set of demographic parameters. And then we use a uh, multinomial likelihood function to fit the uh, uh, observed frequency or fit the model to the observed uh, frequency spectrum. And then we can get parameter estimates uh, that way. Okay, so I'll walk you through what we found when we did this for the, uh, the Han and the uh, Danish populations. So first, focusing on N3 or the current effective population size, and I'll, I'll come back to the issue in a few, uh, in a few minutes of, current, of uh, effective versus census population size, because I think that's actually something that's particularly interesting from these data that we can uh, get at. Um, so essentially what we find here, if we look at our parameter estimates for N3, um, what we find in the uh, Han Chinese, we estimate the effective size was something of on the order of about a million uh, individuals compared to about 250,000 in, uh, in the Danes. So the error bars there denote 95% uh, confidence intervals obtained from uh, block bootstrap of the data. And so what we find, in fact, is that the current size of the Han do, uh, do indeed fear to, uh, appear to be larger, uh, or does appear to be larger than that of the Danes. If we look at the T3 or the time interval during which this recent growth uh, occurred, we find that the growth appears to have been more uh, ancient, maybe closer to uh, 8,000 years ago in the Han compared to within the last 5,000 years in the, uh, in the Danes. The size before population growth, so N2, that was also, we also estimate was larger in the, uh, in the Han than the Danes. So both N2 three and N2, those both parameters were larger in the, uh, the Han Chinese than the Danes. And finally, the time interval uh, 
during which the population uh, was of size n2, uh, there the pattern flips where the, uh, this time interval appears to have been longer for the, for the Danes than, than the hand. So the parameter estimates appear to be quite, uh, quite different from each other. And the one that I think is probably most interesting uh, of, of these four parameters is the um, N3 or the current effective population size that we estimate in these two, uh, in, in the, from these two populations. And so what we can do is compare the effective population size that we estimated from the genetic variation data to what census records uh, reveal uh, the population size sh should look like. So these are the essentially the estimates that I, the point estimates that I showed on the, uh, the previous slide of the um, effective size for the Han and the Danes. And you see that the uh, Han, it's about fourfold larger than that of the, of the Danes. And if we take the census size, so this is census for data from uh, 1952. Um, and the important thing is for the Han here, I'm only considering the Anhui province, which is where these individuals were sampled from, because obviously uh, China is a big uh, place relative to Denmark uh, geographically. And so if we in take all of China together, that's probably not a realistic um, uh, thing to do because our individuals were actually sampled from a particular area and their ancestry probably comes from that uh, particular, at least to first approximation, around that particular area. Maybe not there exactly, but uh, within that general area. Um, and so these are the, the numbers that we come up with from census records. And what we can do is look at the ratio of um, census to effective size uh, for each of the two populations. And if you do that, we find we get a ratio, or what I'm calling R here, of about of 28.7. So in other words, the census size is 28, about 28 times bigger than the effective size that we estimate. But if we now look at the Danish population, we find that the census size is only about 17 times bigger than, uh, than what we estimate uh, the effective size to be. Yes? Yeah, good question. So part of it was, uh, the, the practical reason was data availability. So they had, for the Anhui province in particular, it was easy to get the estimate from 1952, and then we wanted it to be um, comparable to the, uh, b between the two populations. The other thing to think about, though, too, is in terms of um, uh, generation time. So 1952, that's, uh, there's probably been only two or three generations since then. And while we do have big sample sizes in our data and bigger than what you know, people have uh, previously been using, the bulk of those mutations probably did not arise in the last two or three generations, but sometime further back in the past. So in some sense, um, that's probably not the, um, uh, the more current census size is probably not um, necessarily reflecting either what we have in our, in our sample. Uh, I mean, I guess it would be interesting to actually look to see if we had other time points to see how these numbers vary uh, across the, the two populations. Yeah, they can see that the ratio is quite different, right? The ratio of census to I guess it would depend on the, right, the rate of population increase and how that differed between the two populations with the, at the different time points. Yeah, that, that's uh, be a good thing to, to have a look at. Uh, so the question then is, uh, do these, obviously the numbers differ, but are, do they differ significantly? And so what we did was we actually looked at a likelihood ratio test. I can talk about the, the details after if anyone's interested, but we compared a model where we assumed that this ratio was the same between the two populations uh, versus a model where we assume, or essentially estimate two different ratios, one for each population. And it turns out that the model where we have different ratios for the two populations uh, fits the data significantly better. Uh, than one with a, the same ratio. And so I think this is an interesting um, point that the ratio uh, between effective and census size does seem to differ between the two populations. I mean, typically everybody, for most populations, the uh, effective size is somewhat smaller and often substantially smaller than that of the census size, but the, and that's what we see here too. But the relative difference between the two populations uh, um, I think is, is particularly interesting, and it's suggesting that there's something that we haven't included in the model that could uh, explain this pattern. And some possibilities would include um, well, cryptic population structure that we didn't include in the model. We're assuming that the Danes are a randomly mating population, as are the, uh, the um, 
the hand, and so we don't include population structure, and that potentially could have an effect. Uh, another explanation is there could be greater variance in reproductive success within the, uh, the Han Chinese population, and so as a result, then, that's decreasing the, uh, the effective size uh, there. Um, or you could also have greater variance in family size in the Han than in the, uh, in the Danes, potentially, and that could have uh, 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 greater uh, decouple the, um, uh, um, the two factors, the census and effective size, uh, from each other. So, in summary, for this part of my talk, we found evidence for recent population growth within both populations within the last uh, 8,000 years. The current effective size of the Han is larger than that of the, uh, the Danes. And um, the ratio of the census to effective size is higher in the Han than the Danes, suggesting some sort of population um, specific differences in uh, mating practices potentially. So, um, the next question is, do patterns of deleterious variation uh, differ between the Han Chinese and the Danes? And what we're going, uh, previous studies have, uh, that have looked at the question of um, deleterious mutations have estimated the distribution of selection coefficients on new non-synonymous mutations to look something like this, where you have uh, maybe about 35 percent of mutations are essentially strongly deleterious and maybe 25 or so are essentially nearly neutral. So these are new non-synonymous or amino acid changing mutations. They tend to follow this kind of distribution of uh, fitness effects. So these are for new mutations, not for those variants that are actually segregating and sampled in the population. That's an important uh, distinction. So. The point of that slide was to say that many non-synonymous mutations are, have an, are evolutionary, evolutionarily deleterious. So what we can do is compare then uh, looking at, we can look at synonymous SNPs and non-synonymous SNPs. So the synonymous ones are putatively neutral and the non-synonymous have some fraction of, uh, some fraction of them are deleterious. We can also classify the SNPs as being variable only in the Danes, uh, meaning that the Danes, you see two different alleles segregating, but in the Han, they, everybody has one allele. Or the flip side, where the Han have two alleles segregating and the Danes only have one allele segregating. There's a third category of SNPs that are those that are shared uh, between both populations, but uh, this analysis here is focusing on these two categories. And so you can classify all of the coding SNPs essentially into this two by two table. And if you do, you strongly reject homogeneity when you apply your favorite um, test of homogeneity. And what you, the reason for that is there's a higher proportion of, or a higher proportion of the private SNPs in hand are non-synonymous compared to what's seen in the Danes. So in other words, about 67 or so percent of the uh, private SNPs in hand are non-synonymous, but under 65 percent of the um, private SNPs in the Danes are non-synonymous. And if you say, well, it could, could this be a feature, you know, of our data? What happens if you look at this pattern in other, uh, another data set and include more populations in? You see an interesting pattern here. So this is data taken from the Thousand Genomes Project. So we have more populations but slightly smaller sample sizes per population. And so this is, uh, these are different populations here with dry, ASN is East Asian and EUR is European. Uh, and this is uh, African uh, population from Africa. And what you can see is, is that on the y-axis here, I'm plotting the proportion of non-synonymous SNPs. Uh, these aren't private to any population. These are just the proportion uh, overall. And what you can see is as you essentially move away from Africa, the proportion of non-synonymous SNPs uh, increases. And in this data set as well, the proportion is higher uh, within the East Asian population as compared to the, uh, to the European population. And so this is, in fact, suggesting that this is you know, not an artifact of our exome sequencing data, but instead an actual feature of, these, uh, of population history affecting patterns of uh, deleterious mutations. And I don't have time to go through all the, the, the modeling details, but uh, I've done some modeling looking at essentially what the proportion of non-synonymous SNPs would look like as a function of demographic history. So what this plot is showing is how on, on this side here, the proportion of non-synonymous SNPs changes over time, where this is the present day and this is back further in the past. And what you can see is that um, if you have a, bot uh, a bottleneck, which was included at this particular time point, that results in a decrease in the proportion. And then recovery of the bottleneck from the bottleneck results in an increase. And the important feature is 
this population, here I simulated uh, recent population growth within the last 80 or so generations, and that resulted in an uh, increase in the um, proportion of non-synonymous SNPs. So in, in summary, what this simulation is showing is that the proportion of non-synonymous SNPs can increase uh, due to recent population growth, and that um, the more extreme recent population growth in the Hand than in the Danes, as what I uh, estimated, could uh, account for this pattern. Yes? I, I just want to make sure I understand the logic. So uh -huh. Help me out here. It, the logic is that um, most of those non-synonymous SNPs are going to be deleterious. Yep. Selection will eventually weed them out if they aren't fatal prior to reproduction, but that takes time. So if there are a lot of them, then the, the, that greater percentage must have occurred relatively recently because selection hasn't yet filtered them out. That's right. That's right. And the growth leads to um, putting in more non-synonymous or more deleterious mutations into the population recently. Exactly. If you were to, I, that's exactly right. And if you were, I just would add to that, if you look really long into the future, you actually predict that the proportion of um, non-synonymous SNPs is eventually going to taper off and actually decrease and actually be lower than the value seen in the ancestral population because selection will be even more effective in the much larger population at reducing deleterious mutations. But the key feature is that the growth was very recent, uh, at least on an evolutionary time scale, and so there hasn't been enough time for selection to get rid of all of those uh, mutations, particularly the weakly deleterious ones. The more strongly deleterious ones can be eliminated more quickly and, in some sense, more effectively because you have the larger population um, even, uh, uh, even sort of in the present day. Feel free to either ignore or defer this question, but. It, when, when things get into the recent past, do you start to worry that, that technology is buffering um, so that those are accumulating and not being filtered? Yeah, no, that's, I get that question a lot. And I think the, I haven't actually done the, the simulation, but I, 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 my guesstimate would be that the sample sizes are, that we're looking at in the present day probably aren't big enough so that we would necessarily see that effect. In other words, the buffering's been too recent to really be picked up. Um, but if we were to go look ahead into the future, if somebody were to try to repeat this in a few centuries later, they might run into this uh, problem. Okay, so in summary, the uh, Han Chinese have a larger current effective size than the Danes do. They tend to carry a higher proportion of non-synonymous SNPs, and that can be explained by demography as we've just been, um, been discussing. Um, it'll, purifying selection takes some time to remove these deleterious mutations. Okay, so now I'll um, turn to the second part of my talk, looking at genetic variation on human Y chromosomes and uh, evolutionary implications of that. So first at the outset, I'll say that this uh, project, the paper on this project has recently been published in PLOS Genetics, came out I think last month. And this is a collaborative project with Melissa Wilson Sayers and Rasmus Nielsen from, uh, from Berkeley. And um, you know, they, they conceived of the project and I did some of the uh, computational work for it. So, because we often don't typically think about the Y chromosome, I'll just uh, show you what the structure of the Y chromosome looks like, uh, the human Y chromosome. And essentially, there are these discrete classes of sequence along the Y uh, chromosome where you have some sequences that essentially what are called X degenerate, and these would be those that can be aligned to the X chromosome, uh, and they're shown here in yellow. There are these ampliconic regions, which are uh, these, the ones shown in blue, and these are highly repetitive regions. They're, uh, they have palindromes in them, and the topic of them is, a, again, a whole separate discussion for, you know, why they're there and what they do. And the red portion referred to, uh, re, uh, or what are referred to as recently transposed um, uh, segments, and these were copied over onto the human Y fairly uh, recently in an evolutionary time scale. So the Y chromosome is essentially a hodgepodge of sequence from, uh, that got there in different ways from different time points. So why do population geneticists care about the Y chromosome? Well, mostly because it was easy to reconstruct, pop easy to reconstruct population history from, from these kinds of markers. They're paternally inherited with no recombination. So in principle, you can make a genealogy from them pretty, uh, pretty easily. The interesting thing, though, is that uh, population genesis may also be interested because the selection will have a particularly strong effect on the Y chromosome for several reasons, but the, the main one is that there's no recombination occurring on the Y chromosome. So if you have 
selection occurring, it'll affect the linked neutral variation. In other words, it'll affect sites that themselves are neutral, but they're just tagging along or hitchhiking with the um, sites under selection. But the extent of selection is a bit unclear because there's not too many uh, coding genes on the Y chromosome. So we'll, we'll come back to this point uh, in a few minutes. So some previous work on the Y chromosome essentially found low levels of diversity, and there have been essentially two different explanations uh, posed to, uh, to explain this pattern, um, the first being an unequal sex ratio and the second being natural selection. So how could an unequal sex ratio in the population explain uh, uh, low diversity on the Y chromosome, well, it would work something like this. So if you imagine we have uh, uh, a male here who carries one Y chromosome and two autosomes and a female who carries two autosomes but no uh, Y chromosome, and we have a whole population of these individuals and we have an equal number of males and females here, uh, which is what this graph is showing, well, then what, what you'll find is that there's one Y chromosome for every four uh, autosomes, or in other words, one pink uh, chromosome for every... Uh, uh, for blue ones. And so what that predicts is that the effective population size of the Y chromosome should be a quarter of that of the, of the autosomes. If, however, we have uh, a larger effective population size in females than in males, you might see something like this, where now the number of autosomes much more vastly outnumbers the uh, number of Y chromosomes. And again, I should point out this, we're talking about effective population size here. So the census size could, in fact, be uh, be the same number of males and females, but it's just that there are um, some males that tend to reproduce a lot and then others that don't reproduce you know, at all. And so in other words, greater variance in male reproductive success is what this pattern could be looking at. So the goal of our study, uh, two goals here, one is to look at diversity in the Y chromosome and then second, uh, assess the evolutionary uh, forces that could be responsible for that. In other words, sex bias demography versus various kinds of natural selection. So what we did was we looked at uh, human, uh, complete uh, uh, human genome sequences from 16 unrelated males, 8 African and 8 European, and we had high uh, coverage here. And so the important point is we're looking at full genome sequencing, so not just exome sequencing, and we have uh, good coverage of the um, autosomes, X chromosome, mitochondrial DNA, and Y chromosome. Uh, we went, performed an extensive set of uh, uh, bioinformatic filters that... I won't um, uh, go through, but suffice to say we wanted to look at putatively neutral, neutrally evolving sites uh, that were uh, amenable to uh, analysis. So what we did was we looked at genetic diversity on these, uh, 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 from these different four compartments of the genome. We also corrected for differences in mutation rate on the uh, different uh, chromosomal compartments by using human chimp divergence estimates. And so we looked at the diversity levels, and first we wanted to assess whether uh, sort of standard models of population history combined with um, a skew in the sex ratio could explain the patterns of diversity on the Y chromosome, autosomes, X chromosome, and mitochondrial DNA. So the way we did that was we used coalescent simulations, which is, a, again, a way to quickly simulate uh, neutral genetic variation data under complex models of population history. And so we considered uh, a you know, realistic model of, of uh, population history for Africa and Europeans, and then we modeled changing the uh, uh, sex ratio in the, the population. And so this is what we found, and I'll walk you through what this uh, slide here is showing. So this is the observed data uh, that I'm showing you uh, here. And what I'm showing is the, so in red is the X autosome. Uh, ratio, so ratio of diversity on the X chromosome divided by the ratio on the autosomes. And same thing here for the, ra the ratio of genetic diversity in the Y chromosome to that of the autosomes. And then lastly, mitochondrial DNA uh, to the autosomes. And then for the two different uh, populations labeled as such. Now, what you expect to see based on what I showed on the uh, a few slides ago is you expect this ratio to be about 75% and the Y to autosome and mitochondrial to autosome ratio to be about 25%. Um, and what we actually see is that for the X autosome ratio, it's roughly around 75%, uh, but it does indeed differ slightly in this. The explanation for this has been, or sorry, this pattern has been seen in other data sets, and um, there's very, uh, various uh, other researchers are interested in quantifying what could be going on there. Um, 
the mitochondrial DNA fits this pattern reasonably, or fits the expectation reasonably well, but what we see is that the Y autosome ratio is actually much lower than what we would predict uh, from sort of a simple model of um, where the Y diversity would be a quarter of that of the autosome. Um, so if we then look at what we would expect to see under models of population history, what uh, what, would, what would you expect the diversity levels to look like? Well, under a model where there's an equal number of reproducing males and females in the population, we'd expect something like this. And what you see is, in fact, that this model predicts, again, that the diversity on the Y to autosome, or the diversity in the Y chromosome should be higher than what we actually observe. So if we then start to skew the sex ratio a little bit, where there's essentially more reproducing females than males, then what we start to see is that does reduce the Y to autosome ratio versus, uh, compared to an equal sex ratio in the population, which is what we would expect. But we're still not approaching the, uh, or not quite reaching the uh, levels of diversity that are seen on the Y autosome. But another interesting thing is happening here, and that is that now the X autosome ratio and the mitochondrial to autosome ratio starts to become, uh, the, the model doesn't fit the data. And we can keep going, and again, we're not approaching, or we're approaching, but we're not reaching the uh, wide autosome ratio that we see, and we're starting to not fit for the other compartments of the genome. So in summary, based on this analysis, we concluded that sex bias demography by itself, not to say it's not occurring, but that that by itself cannot explain the low level of diversity on the uh, Y chromosome. And so we wanted to look at other explanations that could uh, explain it. And so one explanation is what's called background selection, and I'll explain what that, what that is uh, in, in a second. And the basic, but the basic concept is that you have, if deleterious mutations are occurring on the Y chromosome, and that the Y chromosome, because it doesn't recombine with other chromosomes, then purifying selection would essentially remove the whole Y chromosome, thus reducing genetic diversity at all neutral sites. So the way it might work is something like this, where if we have a population of Y chromosomes here, and we have neutral genetic variants shown here in blue occurring on some of those. And then deleterious mutations occur on these chromosomes as well, shown by these red X's. And if these red X's are then eliminated by natural selection from the population, they're going to take with it their linked neutral sites. So even though the blue mutations have no, themselves have no fitness effect, because they're on the same Y chromosome as a deleterious mutation, they get essentially eliminated by selection. And thus, we're left with less genetic diversity than uh, what we would have started with. So that's called background selection. And we wanted to evaluate whether that could um, be compatible with what we're actually uh, seeing on the, the data. So again, what does the structure of the Y chromosome look like? It has these different classes of, um, of sites. And it turns out there's some act, there are actually some genes here on, on the Y chromosome, maybe somewhere between 20 and 30 uh, protein coding genes that uh, tend to be located in the X degenerate region. And there's been some previous work suggesting that there could be uh, purifying selection acting on, on these genes, uh, work from humans, uh, primates, and then more broadly at, uh, on mammals. Um, so there, there's pure, there could be purifying selection acting on these genes. And we wanted to assess, well, could, could purifying selection on these coding regions essentially generate enough of a background selection effect to reduce diversity to what the levels we actually saw? And so to look at this, uh, I performed forward in time uh, simulations that include essentially all of these different uh, evolutionary forces. And I'm happy to talk after about some of the specifics of how this, how this works if anybody's interested. But the basic idea here is what we wanted to do was look at diversity, genetic diversity at neutral sites given um, about 60,000 coding sites that were under selection or under purifying selection with a particular average strength of selection that we specified. And then we wanted to look at a variety of different uh, strengths of selection uh, to see if any of those are compatible with the data. And so we can compute p-values uh, from this. So here are the results of that analysis. So this is assuming, again, that there's purifying selection acting only on the coding sites in the Y chromosome. And then we're looking at how much is neutral diversity reduced in those kinds of models. And the p-value, which is what I'm showing here on the y-axis, is essentially the proportion of simulation replicates that are more extreme than what we actually uh, observed. So smaller p-values indicate that the data still stand out relative to the model, and larger p-values mean that there's a better fit of the data to the model. 
Um, and the x-axis here is looking at the average strength of selection acting on the coding mutations. In all cases, we assume there's a distribution of selection coefficients, and so this is just the, the average. In all cases, most mutations are uh, nearly, nearly neutral, weakly deleterious, and then there's a tail of strongly deleterious ones. The different colors denote the uh, African and European populations. So blue is for European and red is for African. And the dashed versus solid lines is referring to whether what we assume the sex ratio in the population is. So the solid line is if we assume an equal number of males and females. And the dashed line is if we assume there is a sex bias uh, present there where there are more reproducing females than males. And this, we didn't just pick 0.38. That's a number that had been previously estimated. Uh, by some work that I and other people had done. Um, and so the punchline here is that for the African population, we find that the, really none of these models actually fit the data really well. For the European population, uh, it depends on the, what the sex ratio in the population is. If there actually is a sex bias, then background selection on the coding mutations combined with that sex bias demography could actually fit the data reasonably well. But if there's no sex bias demography, then uh, uh, pure background selection coming only from the coding regions can't explain the, uh, the reduction in diversity. So that model couldn't explain all of our data, so we uh, as, uh, looked at an, another model that incorporated uh, selection on non-coding sites. And in particular, there's these ampliconic regions, and there's, there, I don't have time to get into all the, the details of them, but potentially there, some of those regions could be under selection uh, as well. Um, and so we wanted to essentially estimate the number of sites that would have to be under selection on the Y chromosome in order to explain the reduction in diversity that we actually see at the linked neutral uh, uh, sites. And so I developed a new approximate likelihood method to essentially estimate that. And again, I don't have time to sort of go through that method, but I'm happy to chat afterwards if anybody's interested. And so I'm just showing you here the uh, punchline or the final results that we get uh, from that. Um, so what this is showing you here is an estimate of the number of sites that uh, are affected by purifying selection on the Y chromosome on the Y axis and then the different populations here on the X axis. The uh, points represent the uh, point uh, estimates and the bars are the 95% uh, confidence intervals. And the different lines here represent different uh, amounts of uh, sex bias uh, uh, in the population. The ones, by the way, shown in these boxes are the ones that we actually estimate from neutral X auto, from our neutral X autosome data. That's the extent of the sex bias that we estimate uh, in the data. And so the punchline here is in fact that um, we estimate about four megabases in the African population and somewhere between I guess one to two megabases in the European population of uh, additional sites in the Y chromosome would be affected by uh, purifying selection. And if so then that would generate a sufficient background selection effect to reduce the uh, diversity down to what we've actually uh, observed on the Y chromosome. So in summary, there's lots of evidence for lots of uh, selection on the Y chromosome. What we found is that diversity tends to be extremely reduced on the Y. Demography alone is not a sufficient explanation for this pattern. And instead, the results suggest that selection was pervasive on the Y chromosome and that if purifying selection or the removal of deleterious mutations will explain this pattern, then purifying selection only just on um, single copy coding regions can't explain it. And instead, there'd have to be additional sites uh, that we estimate somewhere uh, between a couple megabases or so of sites would have to be under selection. And I should point out that this analysis doesn't actually exclude formally uh, recurrent, essentially selective sweeps, or in other words, uh, extensive positive selection for adaptive mutations on the Y chromosome. Though what we'd based on looking at the genealogy of the Y chromosome, would have to conclude that if the positive selection were to be the um, explanation, you'd have to have multiple sweeps occurring in different populations. So it's not just a single sweep sort of a long time ago that was shared by all the populations. So in principle, that we can't exclude that as an explanation for, for the data either. So uh, there are a lot of people to acknowledge for this work. Uh, and for the first part of the talk, uh, Mingzi Hei, who is a um, student from BGI in China who actually uh, worked with us on this. He did a lot of the heavy lifting on that and was helped by Emilia uh, Huerta Sanchez. Um, Bernard Kim from my group did some of the work with the 1,000 Genomes data. And then on the Y chromosome project, again, uh, Melissa did uh, a lot of the heavy lifting on that. Um, 
as well. So I'd be happy to take any additional questions, and thanks for listening. Yes. Got a clarifying question. Right? Sure. That's a little more substantive. Um, in the medical literature, a SNP is a polymorphism in which the uh, minor allele is at least one percent in the population, and less than that is considered a rare variant. But you were talking about instances where you only found one example of the rare variant, uh, or a SNP, as you called it. Well, why the difference in terminology? So. I think partly maybe, I mean, it's purely a semantic uh, difference in terminology. I mean, there's no, 1% is not really a, I mean, not really a, there's no theoretical basis for suggesting 1% is common, but less than that is, is necessarily rare. So I refer to SNP as any sort of, regardless of frequency, as any single base change that's not an insertion deletion or multinucleotide change, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I, I guess maybe the proper, the new term that's come out, maybe SNV, single nucleotide variant, and because they're not considering it a polymorphism because it's too rare. So, um, I mean, in my mind, I, I think it's, if you say common and you're, or rare, it, that's providing a little more information, but I, I think it's still, if you, if the, precise frequency matters, then it's better just to give it rather than call it something in particular. Because I, I think it's not completely agreed upon universally whether which definition is, is right. And certainly, um, you know, historically, if you go back in resequencing data, I mean, uh, even five years and the, look at the older resequencing data, they sort of called everything SNPs, even if it was a little bit rarer. But there were fewer of those studies than there are now. So. Um this uh, selection uh, on the Y chromosome. Yes. Uh, you talked about situations in which a s only a subset of males reproduce. Uh, you call that a demographic. Uh, uh, yes. <coughs> and then you also talked about um, a, 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 a kind of purifying selection against the Y chromosome. What's the difference there? I mean, if only a certain population, are you saying that in the first case it's just a random set of males that get to reproduce? And in the second case, it's a special group that have different traits? Uh, essentially, yes. And, and different traits, it's not necessarily, so let me back up actually. The, so when we're talking about the demographic explanation, what that means is, is that some uh, males will, for whatever reason, but presumably not related to the genetic material on their Y chromosome, will be reproducing more than others. And in the second case, it's saying that uh, there are certain mutations that either because of at some level in the reproductive process, mutations that uh, essentially make those males less fit, whether it's at attracting mates or whether it's producing sperm or something somewhere in the middle. Yes? Well, I, I was thinking the same lines of Andrew. I mean, if if you have a effective polygyny in mating structure, then the only way that can be due to something other than um, either positive selection, negative selection, or both, is if there's some entirely exogenous variable like hereditary position, for example, or wealth, right? That has nothing to do with the phenotypic quality of the individual, it's just an accident of birth. Right. I mean, that's conceivable within at least the last few thousand years, especially maybe in your Han population. Um, but going back 8,000 years, that seems less likely. Um, uh, so, I mean, what other exogenous factor can, can produce effective polygyny is what I'm asking. That is, that it doesn't re reflect genotypic quality and therefore doesn't actually um, interact it isn't actually a manifestation of either positive or negative selection. I mean, I, so I guess in terms of the, for the second part, it could be, in terms of the Y chromosome, it could be that the, if it is genetic, that it's not coming from the Y chromosome, and then it would essentially have that effect. But in terms of actually talking also about the first part, where there we are looking at autosomal, uh, the autosomal genome rather than the, uh, the Y chromosome, and then essentially are looking at an effect more genome-wide, I mean, I guess it depends on the extent of genetics versus cultural characteristics, I think. And I, I think that's, I, mean, I guess you would, as, as a group, would probably know better, better than I in terms of how likely that is to, um, to be in effect. Um, I, I think there, 
I think it's interesting, though, that the sort of if you look at all species, or I shouldn't say all, but the majority, the effective sizes that people estimate from genetic variation data tend to be often much smaller, orders, many orders of magnitude smaller than the census size, whether it's um, from humans down to Drosophila and, and everything in between. And so, so I think there is some universal set of things that could be explaining that. And, and it's actually, some actually do argue that selection could be, could be, rampant selection could be actually one of those that's reducing diversity sort of genome wide. But I think mostly it's this kind of either demographic, either random demographic things or um, the spatial population structure or for humans some kind of cultural factors. So I'm, I'm not, so I guess I've, I've, in conclusion, I'm not, other than, like, like you mentioned, wealth or, or those kinds of things, uh, I'm not sure of specifically what other than uh, that, that wouldn't be tied to genotype. But I think you have to then think of whether those things are tied to genotype or not. Yeah. I mean, social stratification in general will produce that pattern of effective collision because yep. there will be hypergeny in which females, regardless of social status, will have relatively good reproductive opportunities because they can always move up by virtue of the fact that they're in demand, but males who are on the bottom don't have that. Um, and so it, it doesn't matter what is causing the stratification. If there's stratification, it'll have those reproductive consequences. And so, so do you think that could be, I guess over what time scale do you think that could be operating? You're saying that certainly more modern times it could be, but how yeah, far back I mean, do you... we need somebody who knows the history of China here, and I don't. So, um, I mean, I don't, I don't know how far back you get, you know, a uh, highly stratified society. In, in Denmark, I would think you probably don't, because I mean, at least my, maybe my folk vision of Denmark is a much more egalitarian yep. system than yep. in dynastic China. But I, I'm just spewing you. I don't know. I need somebody who knows. Yeah, no, that'll be, I think, something that is sort of to tighten that up would be, would be helpful to, to add in there. Sure. Thank you. Yes. I'm from the history department. Uh -huh. So this is really interesting to me, thinking about um, in terms of time depth uh -huh. and closed populations, because the way that this sort of research has been migrating over, literally, to the history department <laughs> is in migration history. And the question of where populations intersect, and there's been a lot of conflict over what these genetic studies mean for us. And I was wondering, in the population models you presented, it seemed to assume a closed population that wasn't being affected by any sort of migration. And going back to the previous question, the question of what what is a Dane 500 years ago is seems to me a problematic one. Yeah, yeah, and I think so. We're doing some work actually looking at the. Uh, jointly modeling the Han and the, um, the Danes together, allowing for some migration. But that's, again, still somewhat different than, that's migration between those two continents. And so it's not looking at what's happening sort of within the particular, uh, or within the particular population. Um, and I, I think, again, it's, a, it's also an issue of time scales, right, in terms of whether, if you have very recent migration, whether that's affecting essentially the frequency, uh, certainly it will affect certain attributes of genetic variation, but in terms of how it affects the frequency spectrum, I'm not sure it would necessarily have that much of an effect. Um, it would affect things like I, tracks of identity by descent and other kinds of um, features of the genetic variation more. So in some sense, I, I think that it's, I mean, essentially it comes out in the effective population size. In, in other words, that the effective, what the effective population size means is essentially a population size that makes the, the population genetic models and equations all work to match the observed patterns of genetic variation. And so what that means is if there is cryptic structure, that can then inflate or deflate the effective population size. And, um, and I think that's, that's why I said that it, the differences in ratios between effective and census size is encompassing something that we didn't actually model in population structure or migration patterns could be one of those. Um, I think my uh, opinion on the matter would be that there probably would have been more structure within China than within Danes, and, and so I might expect it to, um, if anything, for that to inflate the effective size of the, uh, the Anhui province or, uh, in China relative to what we see in the Danes, and, and that's essentially giving us the opposite pattern. So I don't think that could completely uh, explain the pattern. I mean, one, one thing we could do to actually look at that would be to simulate data from a 
essentially a more complex model of population structure and then see how what happens if you fit a sort of simplified model to it. And that's not a bad thing to try. Yes? Is it possible to um, <clears throat> detect genes elsewhere in the genome that migrated off the Y? Is it possible to detect genes that migrated off the Y? That, that happens, right? I'm not. Because there'd be strong selection to get off it, right? I mean, if, if there's this strong purifying selection. Yeah, yeah. And you know, honestly, I'm not sure if that's been. I mean, Melissa would be a better per, in a better position to answer that. Um, well, there's she, only 30 genes left of them, so a lot of them already have them. But I think what it is is not so much that they're leaving, but more that they're accumulating deleterious mutations, uh, and 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 essentially then they. Are, are no longer alignable to uh, what, what you actually see. In other words, they're not actually going somewhere else. They're just degrading, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure, but that'd be interesting to look at. Yes? I have two questions, comments. I guess the first one is, um, I think it's interesting that uh, Dan mentioned uh, that technology was sort of as a buffer for you know, selecting various alleles, but what's also changing now is that as the cost of gene sequencing decreases, now people are actually using that to prevent their children from inheriting those del deleterious alleles. Uh -huh. so in the future, you could sort of track, like, based on the percentages, you know, how technology is impacting that. And as it becomes more and more common to sort of control what your children's gene pool will look like to sort of monitor that. Yeah, I mean, in some sense, we would be co conducting a time series experiment where this is sort of the first time step, and then in the future, people would have all these data if they think they're any good, and then could use that uh, combined with sequencing later populations. And you probably, I would imagine you might see that, uh, that kind of effect. It's just you would need you know, lots of data and it would be very far into the future that you'd essentially be able to detect it. So it's probably, you know, even within our lifetime of three or four generations on average, it probably won't have, I would imagine, too much of an effect, at least in terms of looking at it in the kinds of way that's, that we typically do. I, I just want to clarify my comments. I think this is an interesting observation, but when I said technology, I don't mean, you know, <laughs> iPads. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. The, the, the reason you get these really rapid population expansion you know, in, after the domestication of plants and animals is because that is technology, yep. right? That is the means yep. of subsistence. Allows yep. a lot more people to live than would have died previously, and so you yep. get these huge rapid expansions. Yep. If a lot more people are living than died previously, you're buffering against the presence of, uh, you know, deleterious consequences. Yeah. So in some sense, that what that's say in a population genetic terms is actually that the strength of selection for these individual mutations in a particular individual is actually becoming weaker because they're more able to um, survive. And, you know, that, that's particularly, um, you know, that's, that's really interesting and, and could be occurring. The interesting thing is with the uh, simulations looking at the effect of recent growth, that, that there I'm assuming that the strength of selection actually is the same. In other words, it's not changing with whatever's allowing for that recent population growth. And even without that kind of change in the strength of selection, you still expect to see the increase in the proportion of non-synonymous SNPs in the population. So in some sense, both could be finding that one an explanation can cover it doesn't mean that the other is not occurring um, as well. And you know, I think maybe there are other sort of features of the data that might be more, um, that might better allow one to distinguish between those explanations. And I guess the other feature is it might also depend on what genes you're looking at. So there's some uh, genes, for example, like histone proteins or something like that, where if you disrupt them, whether you have agriculture or not, you might be in trouble and you're going to have mutations there will be strongly deleterious regardless. But then other genes that are more related to interaction with the environment or other, maybe some metabolic traits or something like that might be, uh, allow for bigger shifts in selection. Yeah, you might have positive selection too, right? So yeah. You have adult lactase production because now you have domesticated animals, you have, you know, a utility for that enzyme that you didn't have before. Right. Like right. Um, no. Oh, yes, you had a second question. That's right. Yeah, so I 
the gene sequencing methods vary so greatly. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about some of the limitations in the data set. <laughs> um, um, I just have a little bit of knowledge in this area, but from what I understand, there's like recently been a company called Pacific Biosciences that now has managed to sort of reduce the error rate to like one error in a million base pairs. And they basically can now, uh, I think, sequence up to like each SNP length is about a third to a fourth of the entire genome length. And so I was wondering how that would also impact your yeah, I mean, obviously, the better the technology is, the easier all the downstream inferences are, and and I think that e even the just the, the sort of regular um, Illumina sequencing, it's improved quite a bit over the few years that it's been around, and and that has a noticeable effect on, you know, it's easier to analyze the newer data because it's just the quality is better, the reads are longer, it's easier to align them, that sort of thing. Um, and, and that'll continue, and if, if we can get, uh, the, the, the more that, that happens, then the, the more the sequencing improves, the better off we'll be. Um, I'm not sure, so I haven't worked with the Pacific Biosystems data. This is, uh, was all Illumina sequencing data, which is what a lot of the next-gen data right now uh, typically are. Um, so I guess I'm not really ready to comment on the Pacific Biosystems yet. Um, for the Illumina data, I mean, you can have difficulties at various steps in the pipeline. So what I told you is you can get a lot of data pretty cheaply, but the quality of it is uh, quite variable. So not, not that in aggregate you can't make good inferences, but there's a lot of um, steps to take what you get off the machine to transform it into what's essentially useful. And, and so in particular, what you get are these short fragments or reads that you then have to align to a reference genome. And so the longer the reads are, you're going to have an easier time mapping it. So Poorly mapping the reads is one way you can run into problems. Uh, then you can also have like specific errors in the sequence, and there's sort of known features of the chemistry that can introduce them. And so that it's another thing that you know they can either work to correct, which is easier uh, if, if you get better sequencing, or you can account for that in the bioinformatic processing. Uh, and then I guess another one easier thing that we had here was the data I talked about were all high coverage data, so you could actually, in other words, the same site was covered multiple times, but a lot of these studies are using lower, and in some cases it's actually better um, in terms of you get more information for, per dollar spent um, if you do lower coverage sequencing of many individuals, but then you have a difficult time inferring the genotypes at any one individual, but the idea is you have to analyze the data then in a probabilistic framework that takes that uncertainty into account, and then you can actually do better with it. But um, it's, yeah, it's definitely a very uh, less so in my group, but, uh, well, actually, I shouldn't say that. We are doing some uh, work on a little bit of methods development for, for dealing with this kind of data, but also with other, other folks are just um, solely focused on trying to analyze this kind of data, and it's, um, there are a lot of subtleties that it's important to, um, to keep in mind. Yes. I think you said, um, when you were giving the uh, figures for the effective population size and ratios, uh, just from a little background I have on this, they seem like very large numbers to me, like a ratio of 30 to 1. Is this unusual for human populations, or is there these in line with others? So well, what I'm thinking of is uh, the kind of thing you used to do in introductory population genetics and after all, of course, you used to teach was. You, you go through like a hunting gathering group and say, well, what are the kind of things that they could be doing to be affecting the, changing the effective population size? And it would be awfully hard to come up with a 30 to 1 ratio between effective to actual population size on the basis of, you know, behaviors that we know about in terms of things that would be affecting, affecting that. So it seems, to me, they seem like these very large numbers. So the first question is whether these numbers are unusual and Exactly. How does one account for these very large numbers? So, so I, I guess, I mean, I guess prior to the last five or so years, people would have said, "What's if you ask somebody, what's the effective population size of humans?" I think everyone would have said ten thousand, right? In terms of what's been estimated from the genetic variation data. So, I think in some sense that's even further away. Or in other words, a bigger ratio the, by several orders of magnitude than what I'm saying here. And I think that I, we have a handle on why that is, because that 10,000 is essentially averaging over uh, you know, really long history, multiple bottlenecks, et cetera, and is unduly influenced by what we're, by 
events in the ancient past and this recent growth, because the estimate came from small sample sizes, the recent growth is essentially missed in all of that. And that's why the effective size was estimated to be lower. So in some sense, what we're estimating is much, much larger than that. And, um, but you're right, it's still not in line with, I mean, it's still a 30-fold difference between the effective size, uh, or sorry, between the current-ish census size and what we see now. And um, I mean, I think what it is is there are factors that we're not including in, in the model. Um, and you know, they're, I guess it's right now, it's not clear exactly which is dominating other than some sort of variance in reproductive success, I think could be, could be one of them. Um, and in terms of are these in line with what other people are estimating, so I think ballpark, I'd say yes. In terms of for the, for the Danes that we have, um, we, if I'm remembering right, we estimate something like 259,000 was the effective size, and then other Europeans said then in the low to mid hundreds of thousands. So it's, you know, in the right ballpark, though again, it's sort of hard to know what should they exactly be the same? Because the other studies that looked at this probably had a sample from other countries other than just Denmark. So they probably should be a little bit bigger. But again, how much bigger? I think it's a little tricky, uh, tricky to say. But I mean, we're at least, I think, in the right ballpark. Thank you.